So thank you for coming to High Mind Reads, our library's guest reader program. Please stay after the recorded reading for an off-camera and candid discussion if you like. Live automated captions are available. If the captions didn't show up for you automatically, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to view subtitles. You can also click, uh, you can also view the full transcript so you can see what was said earlier. And if you'd rather not see the captions, you can turn them off by selecting hide, sub hide subtitle. Before we start our program, we'd like to share a land acknowledgement. We would like to recognize the indigenous people whose land we are on today. Highline College itself and where many of us live and work resides on ancestral native lands of the Duwamish Nation. And depending on where you are exactly in this region, many of us live and work on the Muckleshoot, Duwamish and Puyallup Nations indigenous lands. We honor the land and give gratitude to the First Nations people who are here, who continued to steward this land since time immemorial. To learn more about native land, check out the Native Land Project, an interactive map that we'll link to in the chat. We also encourage you to learn more about indigenous studies to our library resource guide, which will also be linked in the chat. This guide includes books, ebooks, and websites revolving around Native Americans and Indigenous studies. Um, if you have additional suggestions for information resources to add to the guide, please reach out to us. And if you're able, we also encourage you to consider taking action um, by donating to, to a cause such as Real Rent Duwamish. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we're indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows for our collective benefit. We encourage you to learn more about black studies on our library resource guide, um, which will be linked in the chat. And again, if you have um, suggestions for additional information, please reach out to the Highline librarians. Okay, thank you all. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Emoja Black Scholar student, Sierra Farmer. Sierra will be reading from Sister Outsider Essays and Speeches by Audre Lorde. This book was published by the Crossing Press in 1984. And please stay after for an optional brief discussion if you're able. Um, during the next 30 minutes, we ask that you keep your questions and comments in the chat and a librarian will be sharing related links and respond in the chat during the reading. After the reading, we'll end the recording and welcome everyone to stay for a brief conversational discussion. So that's all for housekeeping details. Everyone get comfortable and welcome Sierra. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, as it was said, I'm gonna be reading Essays and Speeches by Audrey Lloyd. And I wanted to start by reading a blurb on the back to give kind of a background information for anybody who may not be um, familiar with her. So it says, a writer, activist, and mother of two, Audre Lorde grew up in 1930s Harlem. She earned a master's degree in library science from Columbia University, received a national endowment for the arts grant for, for poetry, and was New York State's poet from 1991 to 1993. She's, she is the author of 12 books, including Zami, a new spelling of my name, and the Black Unicorn. Lord died of cancer at the age 58 in 1992. The Highline Reads from Rio. Highline Reads. Presenting the essential writings of Black lesbian poet and feminist writer Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider celebrates an influential voice in 20th century literature. In this changed collection of 15 essays and speeches, where it takes on sexism, racism, ageism, homophobia, and class, and propound social differences as a vehicle for action and change. Her prose is incisive, unflinching, and lyrical, reflecting struggle, but ultimately offering messages of hope. The commemorative edition includes a new forward by Lord Scholar and poet Cheryl Clark, who celebrates the ways in which Lord's philosophies resonate more than 20 years after they were first published. These landmark writings are, in Lord's own words, a call to never close our eyes to the terror, to the chaos which is Black, 
which is creative, which is female, which is dark, which is rejected, which is messy. So that's a little bit on Audrey Wood. I've chosen three different of her, three different poems written by her today. And the first one that I would like to read is entitled Eye to Eye, Black Woman, Hatred and Anger. Where does the pain go when it goes away? Every Black woman in America lives her life somewhere along a wide curve of ancient and unexpressed angers. My Black woman's anger is a molten pound at the core of me, the most fiercely guarded secret. I know how much of my life as a powerful feeling woman is laced through this net of rage. It is an electric thread woven into every emotional tapestry upon which I set the essentials of my life. A boiling hot spring likely to erupt at any point leaping out of my consciousness like a fire on the landscape. How to turn that anger, which accuracy rather than deny it, has been one of the major tasks of my life. Other Black women are not the root cause nor the source of that pool of anger. I know this no matter what the particular situation may be between me and another Black woman at the moment. Then why does it, that anger and wish itself most tellingly against another Black woman taste excuse? Why do I judge her in a more critical light than any other, becoming enraged when she does not measure up? And if behind the object of my attack should lie the face of my own self, unaccepted, then what could possibly cleanse a fire field by such reciprocating passions? When I started to write about the intensity of the angers between Black women, I found I had only began to touch one tip of a three pronged iceberg the deepest understructure of which was hatred, a societal death wish directed against us from the moment we were born black and female in America. From that moment on, we have been steeped in hatred for our color, for our sex, for our ethnicity, and daring to presume we had any right to, to live. As children, we absorb that hatred, passed it through ourselves, and for the most part, we still live our lives outside the recognition of what that hatred really is and how it functions. Echoes of it return as cruelty and anger in our dealings with each other. For each of us bears the place that hatred seeks, and we have each learned to be at home with cruelty because we have survived so much of it within our own lives. Before I can write, a, write about Black women's anger, I must write about the poisonous seepage of hatred that fuels that anger, and of the cruelty that is spawned when they meet. I have found this out by scrutinizing my own expectations of other Black women. By following the threads of my own rage at Black womanness back into the hatred and despisal that embroidered my life with fire long before I knew where that hatred came from or why it was being heaped upon me. Children, only, children know only themselves as reasons for their happenings in their lives. So of course, as a child, I decided there must be something terribly wrong with me that inspired such contempt. The bus driver didn't look at other people like that. All of the things my mother had warned me not to do and be that I had gone right ahead and done must have been to blame. To search for power within myself means I must be willing to move through being afraid of whatever lies beyond. If I look at my most vulnerable places and acknowledge the pain I have felt, I can remove the source of that pain from my enemy's arsenals. My history cannot be used for feather. My history cannot be used to feather my enemy's arrows then and not lessen their power over me. Nothing I accept about myself can be used against me to diminish me. I am who I am, doing what I came to do, acting upon you like a drug or cheese which will remind me of your meanness as I discover you in myself. America's measurements of me has lain like a barrier across the realization of my own powers. I was a barrier which I had to examine and dismantle piece by piece in order to use my energies fully and creatively. It is easier to deal with the external manifestations of racism and sexism than it is to deal with the results of those dissertations internalized within our consciousness of ourselves and one another. But what is the nature of that to connect with each other on any but the most superficial levels? What is the source of that mistrust and distance between black women? I don't like to talk about hate. I don't like to remember the cancellation and hatred, heavy as my wish for death, seen in the eyes of so many white people from the time I could see. It was echoed in newspapers and movies, in holy pictures and comic books, 
and Anos and Andy radio programs. I had no tools to dissect it, no language to name it. The AA subway train to Harlem. I clutch my mother's sleeve, her arms full of shopping bags, Christmas heaven. The wet smell of winter clothes, the train's lurching. My mother spots an almost seat, pushes my little snow-suited body down. On one side of me, a man reading a paper. On the other, a woman in a fur hat staring at me. Her mouth twitches as she stares, and then her gaze drops down, pulling line with it. Her leather gloved hand flexes up the line where my new blue snow pants and her sleek fur coat meet. She jerks her coat closer to her. I look. I do not see whatever terrible thing she is seeing on the seat between us. Probably a roach, but she has communicated her horror to me. I must be something very bad from the way she's looking, so I pull my snowsuit closer to me, away from it too. When I look up, the woman is still staring at me, her nose cold and eyes huge. And suddenly, I realize there is nothing crawling up the seat between us. It is me she doesn't want her coat to touch. The fur brushes past my face as she stands with her shoulder with a shudder and holds on to a strap in the speeding train. Born and bred a New York City child, I quickly slide over to make room for my mother to sit down. No word has been spoken. I'm afraid to say anything to my mother because I don't know what I've done. I look at the side of my snow pants secretly. Is there something on them? Something's going on here I do not understand, but I will never forget it. Her eyes, the flared nostrils, the hate. My three-year-old eyes ache from the machinery used to test them. My forehead is sore. I have been poked and prodded in the eyes and stared into all morning. I huddle into the tall metal and leather chair, grind and miserable and wanting my mother. On the other side of the eye clinic examining room, a group of young white men in white coats discuss my peculiar eyes. Only one voice remains in my memory. From the looks of it, from the looks of her, she's probably simple too. They all laugh. One of them comes over to me, enunciating slowly and carefully. Okay, girly, go wait outside now. He pats me on the cheek. I'm grateful for the absence of harshness. The story our librarian reading Little Black, Little Black Samba. Her white fingers hold up a little book about a shoe button faced little boy with big red lips and many pigtails and a hat full of butter. I remember the pictures hurting me and my thinking again, there must be something wrong with me because every, everybody else is laughing. And besides, the library downtown has given this book title a special prize, the library ladies tells us. So what's wrong with you anyway? Don't be so sensitive. Sixth grade in a new Catholic school, and I'm the first student. The black girls laugh at my braided hair. The nun sends a note home to my mother saying that pigtails are not appropriate attire for school, and that I should learn to comb my hair in a more becoming style. Lexi Goldman and I are on Lexington Avenue, our adolescent faces flushed from springtime and our dash out of high school. We stop at luncheonette and ask for water. The woman behind the counter smiles at Lexi, gives us water. Lexi's in a glass, mine in a paper cup. Afterward, we joke about mine being portable too loudly. My first interview for a part-time job after school. An optical company on Massey Street has called my school and asked for one of its students. The man behind the counter reads my application and looks up at me, surprised by my black face. His eyes remind me of the woman on the train when I was five. Then something else is added, and he looks me up and down, pausing at my breast. My light-skinned mother kept me alive within an environment where my life was not a high priority. She used whatever methods she could at hand, few as they were. She never talked about color. My mother was a very brave woman, born in the West Indies, unprepared for America. And she disarmed me with her silences. Somewhere I knew it was a lie that nobody else noticed. Me, darker than my two sisters. My father, darkest of all. I was always jealous of my sisters because my mother thought they were such good girls, whereas I was bad, always in trouble. Full of the devil, she used to say. They were neat, I was untidy. They were quiet and I was nosy. They were well behaved, I was rowdy. They took piano lessons and won prizes in the department. I stole money from my father's pockets and broke my ankle sledding downhill. They were good looking, I was dark. Bad, mischievous, a born troublemaker, if there ever was one. Did bad mean black? 
the endless scrubbing of lemon juice in the crack and crevices of my ripening, darkening body. And oh, the scent of my dark elbows and knees, my gums that pull back in my neck and the cave of my armpits. The hands that grab me from behind the stairwell are black hands, boys' hands, punching, rubbing, pinching, and pulling at my dress. I hurl to the garbage bags as I'm carried into that trash can and jerk away fleeing upstairs. Boots follow after me. That's right, you better run. My mother taught me to survive from a very early age by her own example. Her silences also taught me isolation, fury, mistrust, self-rejection, and sadness. My survival lay in learning how to use the weapon she gave me, also to fight against those things within myself unnamed. And survival is the greatest gift of life. Sometimes for black mothers, it is the only gift possible and tenderness gets lost. My mother bore, in, bore me into a life as if etching an angry mes message into marble. Yet I survived the hatred around me because my mother made me know by a bleak reference that no matter what went on at home, outside shouldn't ought to be the way it was. And since it was that way outside, I moved in a thin of uh, unexplained anger that encircled me and spilled out against whoever was closest and shared those hated selves. Of course, I did not realize this at the time. The anger lay like a pool of acid deep inside me, and whenever I felt deeply, I felt it attaching itself in the strangest places. Upon those as powerless as I, my first friend asking, why do you go around hitting all the time? Is that the only way you know how to be friends? What other creatures in the world beside a black woman have had to build the knowledge of so much hatred into, into her survival and keep going? It is shortly after the Civil War. In a graystone hospital on 110th Street in New York City, a woman is screaming. She is black and healthy and has been brought here from the South. I do not know her name. Her baby is ready to be born, but her legs have been tied together out of curiosity as science. Her baby birthed itself to death against her bone. Where are you, seven-year-old Elizabeth Edward of Little Rock, Arkansas? It's a bright Monday morning and you are on your way to your first day of school. White hatred running down your pink sweater and a white mother's twisted mouth working, savage and human, wide over your braids held high by their pink ribbons. Numbolo has walked five days from the bleak place where the lorry despite de deposited her. She stands in Cape Town, South Africa ring, her bare feet in the bulldozer tracks where her house once was. She picks up a piece of soaked cardboard that was once covered, that once covered her table and holds it over the head of her baby strapped to her back. Soon she will be arrested and taken back to the reserve where she will not even speak the language. She will never get permission to live near her husband. Eddie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, four little black girls, none more than 10 years of age, singing their last autumn song in a Sunday church school in Birmingham, Alabama. After the explosion cleared, it is not possible to tell which patient or their Sunday shoe belongs to which bound leg. What other human beings absorb so much virulent hostility and still functions? Black women have a history of the use and sharing of power in the Amazon regions of Dahomey through the Ashanti warrior queen, Ya Asantiwa, and the freedom fighter, Harriet Tubman, to the economically powerful market women guides of present West Africa. We have a tradition of closeness and mutual care and support from the all women courts of the Queen Mothers of Benin to the present day sisterhood of the Good Death, a community of old women in Brazil who, as escaped slaves, provide escape and refuge for other enslaved women who now care for each other. We are Black women born into a society of entrenched loathing and contempt for whatever is Black and human. We are strong and enduring. We are also deeply scared. As African women together, we once made the earth fertile with our fingers. We can take the earth there as well as mount the first line of fire in defense of the king. And having killed in his name and in our own, Harriet's rifle speaks, shouldered in the grim marsh, we still know that the power to kill is less than the power to create, for it produces an ending rather than the beginning of something new. Anger, a passion of displeasure that may be excessive or misplaced, 
but not necessarily harmful. Hatred, an, emotionally ha an emotional habit or attitude of mind in which aversion is coupled with ill will. Anger used does not destroy, hatred does. Racism and sexism are grown up words. Black children in America cannot avoid these distortions in their living and too often do not have the words for naming them, but both are correctly perceived as hatred. Growing up, metabolism hatred like a daily bread. Because I am black, because I am woman, because I am not black enough, because I am not some particular fantasy of a woman, because I am. On such a consistent diet, one can eventually come to value the hatred of one's enemies more than one values the love of friends, but that hatred becomes a source of anger, and anger is a powerful fuel. I'm sure sometimes it seems that anger alone keeps me alive. It burns with a bright and undiminished flame. Yet anger, like guilt, is an incomplete form of human knowledge. More useful than hatred, but still limited. Anger is useful to help clarify our differences, but in the long run, strength that is bred by anger alone is a blind force which cannot create the future. It can only demolish the past. Such strength does not focus upon what lies ahead, but upon what lies behind, upon what created it, which is hatred. And hatred is a death wish for the hater, not a life wish for anything else. To grow up metabolizing hatred like daily bread means that eventually, every human interaction becomes tainted with the negative passion and intensity of its byproducts, anger and cruelty. We are African women and we know in our blood's telling the tenderness with which our foremothers held each other. It is that connection which we are seeking. We have the stories of black women who healed each other's wounds, raised each other's children, fought each other's battles, tilled each other's earth, and erased each other's pastures into life and into death. We know the possibilities of support and connection for which we all yearn, but which we dream of so often. We have growing Black women's literature, which is richly evocative of these possibilities and connections. But connections between Black women are not automatic by virtue of our similarities, and the possibilities of genuine connection between us are not easily achieved. Often we give lip service. We often give lip service to the idea of mutual support and connection between Black women because we have not yet crossed the barriers to these possibilities, nor fully explored the angers and fears that keep us from realizing the power of the real Black sisterhood. And to acknowledge our dreams is to sometimes acknowledge the distance between those dreams and our present situation. Acknowledged our dreams can shape the realities of our future if we arm them with the hard work and scrutiny now. We cannot settle for the pretenses of connection or for the parodies of self-love. We cannot continue to evade each other on the deepest levels because we fear each other's angers, nor continue to believe that respect means never looking directly, nor with openness into another Black woman's eyes. I was not meant to be alone and without you who understand. I know the anger that lies inside of me like I know the beat of my heart and the taste of my spit. It is easier to be angry than to be hurt. Anger is what I do best. It is easier to be furious than to be yearning. Easier to crucify myself in you than to take on the threatening universe of whiteness by admitting that we are worth wanting each other. As black women, we have shared so many similar experiences. Why doesn't this commonality bring us closer together instead of setting us at each other's throats with weapons well honed by familiarity. The anger with which I meet another Black woman slides deviation from my immediate need or desire or concept of a proper response is a deep and hurtful anger, chosen only in the sense of choice of desperation, reckless through de despair. That anger which masks my pain that we are so separate who should that anger which masks my pain that we are so separate who should not be together, my pain that she could perhaps not need me as much as I need her, or see me through the blunted eyes of the haters, the eyes I know so well from my own distorted images of her, erase or be erased. I stand in the public library wanting to be recognized by the black woman library clerk seated a few feet behind the desk. She seems engrossed in a book, beautifully in her youth and self-assured, I straighten my glasses, giving a tiny shake to my bangles in the process, just in case she is not seeing me. 
but I somehow know she has. Otherwise motionless, she slowly turns her head and looks up. Her eyes cross mine with a look of such incidental hostility that I feel blurred to the wall. Two male patrons enter behind me. At that, she raises and moves toward me. Yes, she says, with no inflection at all, her eyes carefully elsewhere. I've never seen this young woman before in my life, I think to myself. Now that's what you call an attitude, recognizing the rising tension inside of me. The art beyond insolence of the black girl's face as she cuts her elegant sidelong glance at me. What makes her eyes slide off of mine? What does she do? What does she see that angers her so or infuriates her or disgusts her? Why do I want to break her face off when her eyes do not mean mine? Why does she wear my sister's face? My daughter's mouth turned down about to suck itself in. The eyes of a furious and rejected lover? Why do I dream I cradle you at night? Divide the limbs between the food bowls of my, le my least favorite animals? Keep vigil for you night after terrible night, wondering, oh sister, where is the dark rich land we wanted to wander through together? My blood sister across her living room from me, sitting back in, the ch in her chair while I talk earnestly, trying to reach her, trying to alter the perceptions of me that caused her so much pain. Slowly, carefully, and coldly, I will not miss one single scratching, scaffing word, she says. I am not interested in understanding whatever you're trying to say. I don't care to hear it. I have never gotten over the anger that you did not want me as a sister, nor an ally, nor a diversion one cut above the cut. You have never gotten over the anger that I appeared at all and that I'm different, but not different enough. One woman has eyes like my sister who never forgave me for appearing before she had a chance to win her mother's love as if anybody could ever. Another woman wears the high cheekbones of my other sister who wanted to leave but had only been taught to obey. So now she is dedicated to ruling by obedience, a passive vision. Who do we expect the other to be who is not yet at peace with our own selves? I cannot shut you out the way I shut the others out, so maybe I can destroy you. Must I destroy you? We do not love ourselves, therefore we cannot love each other. Because we see in each other's faces our own face, the face we never stopped wanting. Because we survived and survival breeds desire from ourself. A face we never stopped wanting at the same time, we always tried to obl obliterate it. Why don't we meet each other's eyes? Do we expect betrayal in each other's gaze or recognition? If just once we were to feel the pain of all black women's blood flooding up to drown us, I stayed afloat by the anger so deep at my loneliness that I could only move toward further survival. And that is the first part of that excerpt. And I think one of the main reasons why I chose this part was because she dives into so many different topics, whether it's sexism, racism, how growing up in a black household could have brought on some trauma for her, how her relationship went with her siblings because of that. And I think those are all really important topics, especially in the black community that a lot of people suffer with that isn't talked about a lot. And even though this was written decades ago, it's still prevalent in our society today. Yes, that was the first one. And then the next one I wanted to read is entitled Sierra. I yes. Think, I think we were gonna do a discussion. Yeah, because it is one, it's about 1.30. Oh, it is 1.30. Oh, okay. I didn't see the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was my thoughts on it. If anybody has anything else they'd like to share on that expert. Thank you so much, Sierra. Yeah, of course. So we can end recording now. Um, and we have about yeah, 25 minutes if anyone wants to ask a question.